Like when your partner says, um, you know, I want to feel more fulfilled. What does that mean? Like, do you, do you mean you want to have a date night once a week, or do you mean you want to surf more often? Because I don't know if I should take you out to dinner or drive you to the beach. Right. Like, what, what <laughs> does that specific. mean? Yeah, yeah. Specifically, I think people need to know how to talk to each other. And in fact, why not have a conversation about how you have conversations? Like, why not talk about, listen, when there's a problem in the marriage, how are we going to talk to each other about it? Welcome back, everyone, to the School of Greatest podcast. We have Jim Sexton in the house. Good to see you, it's man. Good to see you, Lewis. Thanks Excited for having me. Excited about this. You've got a book called If You're in My Office, It's Already Too Late, A Divorce Lawyer's Guide to Staying Together. You've been doing divorce, divorce law work for two decades, right? Yeah, about that. A little less than that right Almost now. two decades yeah. working with couples who have gone through every challenge under the sun, right? Who yeah. have been through it all yep. uh, from sleeping with the nanny to <laughs> financial cause issues yep. to what you said, carpooling, who's who's doing what carpooling and what days to little stuff, the big stuff and everything in between. Yeah. You've seen it. Yeah. And you're not a trained therapist, nope. but you've probably had uh, years of work in your experience being a therapist for a lot of people, yeah. I'm assuming, right? Yeah, you know, I, I, I see people at their worst, and yeah. I think I see them in a way that, people still lie to their therapist, you know, mm. but they don't necessarily lie to their divorce lawyer. Why because not? there's a tremendous incentive not to lie to me. You know, lying to your doctor and lying to your lawyer are like the two people you shouldn't lie to. Our mm. only job is to protect you. Our only job is to make sure that, whether your goals are legitimate or illegitimate, our you know, our job's to protect you. Yeah. So, you know, I think I get to see a very, very candid, I know more about their finances than their accountant, I know more about their personal life than their, you know, than their therapist, you know, I, I, I know where all the skeletons are, you why know. Is, and why do they tell more to you than their therapist? Because they have to. I mean, for me to protect them properly. The I mean, the first time I Once meet the them. Once the law is under th their jurisdiction, they're like, okay, I have to tell you. Yes, well, I can lie a little bit, little small lies here and there. To other yeah, I mean, I think other professionals, you just don't feel the automatic sense of you're here to protect me. Yeah. I mean, I, I am there to protect them in the rawest, realest way. You yeah. know, I really am like a shield to them, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I say that's my job. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a shield and a weapon, you know, and, and, and I'm a shield in the sense that my job is to protect my client's interests. Um, and, and I'm a weapon in the sense that I'm there to advocate, you know, uh, uh, what it is that they need me to, to fight for, what it is that they need me to advance, you know. And I represent people who've been cheated on, and I represent people who cheat. And I represent people who their spouse has a drug or alcohol problem, and I represent people who have drug and alcohol problems. So I've spent so much time with every variety of, of the, the person in a couple that that's how the book happened. It really turned yeah. into, you know, look, I'm not a therapist. I'm not a philosopher who's just opining on what I think people do. I'm just telling you what people do. Yeah. I'm just telling you what I see actually happened in actual marriages. This isn't theoretical marriages. This right. is actual marriages. Yeah, the real mess. Yeah, the, yeah, stuff the real that train wreck. Now, you've worked with over a, th is it over a thousand clients yeah, then? easily. Easily. Have there been any clients that you've worked with that were going to get a divorce and then they decided not to after working with you and then and they came back together for whatever reason? Mm -hmm. And if so, what was that reason? It happens pretty rarely. And, and that's why I actually called the book, if you're in my office, it's already too late. Maybe 1% of people? I would say less. even less. Wow. I would say even less. I would say in a 20 year career, it's happened maybe three times. Where mm -hmm. someone, by the time they were in my office, it's so far along and the wound has so festered that it's hard, to just, it's hard to turn it around. I mean, look, that, that's the truth. You know, when you look at people, it's a whole lot easier to, to, to maintain your weight than to get real fat and try to lose it all, right? So it's the same thing with marriages. You know, there's this, you no know, single raindrop's responsible for the flood. You know, there's right. these little right, right. arguments, yeah, these yeah. little issues that people have, and they just build and build and build and build to the point where once that dam breaks, by the time you're in my office, it's done. It's, mm -hmm. it's, and it's rare that people can come back from that. Yeah. You were talking about before we started that marriage is a technology. Yeah. Now, what does that mean? What is the technology well, I mean, of marriage? I, I think 
anything that's designed to solve a problem is a technology, right? So, I mean, this mug is, is, a, is a technology, you know, the, the, and, and what is the problem to which this technology is a solution? Well, it's the problem of I can't hold hot tea in my hand. Yeah. It's a problem of I, I don't want to use, and, and kudos to you uh, uh, for using non-disposable <laughs> ones, um, uh, that zero waste uh, yeah, yeah. You, you listen to. It. Um, and the truth is, is that it, it, it's designed to solve a problem. So. Mm -hmm. The, the next question is who has that problem? Well, you know, anyone who wants to drink a beverage has that problem, you know? And the next question, and I think the most important question is, what problems does it unintentionally create, okay? So every technology is a Faustian bargain in the sense that it solves a problem mm -hmm. and it creates a problem. Now you gotta clean it, you gotta use water exactly. to wash you have it, to, you now you have store to it. You find gotta... stylish ones. I mean, you went, you know, classic plain, but you <laughs> gotta find ones with witty sayings on them and yeah. it can break and now my favorite mug was broken and how am I gonna replace it? I mean, again, some of these problems are silly little problems in exchange for really great benefits. But most people never ask themselves the question, the technology of marriage, which is a man-made technology, a human-made technology, we got together and said, hey, let's create this legal contract. Governed by a state. Right, right. governed by the state. Let's come up with something that let's turn a lover into a relative. Mm -hmm. You know, let's find a way to turn this into a legally binding contract. And mm -hmm. people just go and sign up for this technology. And they spend more time thinking about what cake they should serve at the ceremony then thinking about what did I just sign on for and why did I sign on for it and what are some problems it might create for me in exchange for the things that it solved for me. And by the way, will it even solve the problem that I'm trying to have it solve? And one of the things I talk about in the book is, you know, if you got married to solve the problem of being alone, not you might be alone still in your marriage. Like yeah. if, you solved, if you got married because you want to have sex, you want to have more sex, you know, being married is no more a guarantee of getting sex than living near a restaurant is a guarantee of getting fed. Right. You know, it, it doesn't mean just because you're in it, you're going to receive the benefit that you think you're going to receive of it. And, and how many couples before they get married really sit down and say, hey, we're going to sign up for this technology. What do you want to get from it? What should I be wanting to get from it? How will it change mm -hmm. over the years? That just doesn't happen. Yeah. So, so if that doesn't happen, how are we then surprised? that it doesn't work 53% mm -hmm. of the time. 53% is now the is statistic. Is the divorce rate. In, uh, the, the divorce rate, then more probably still don't work when they're in it. Exactly, so, yeah. so that's, the, that's the part, and it's funny that you go there because that's where <laughs> I go with it. So 53% is already terrifying, right? If I yeah. said to you there's a 53% chance when you walk out of this room you get hit in the head with a bowling ball. Yeah, you're probably you not either, gonna go out. Or you're gonna wear a helmet at a yeah, minimum, yeah, exactly. right? At yeah. a minimum you're gonna wear a helmet, but you probably wouldn't go out. Now let's look at that number though, 53% and then divorce. That's US or global? US. US. US okay. only, okay. Now think about how, what percent stay together for the kids? That should get divorced, but they stay together? can't stand each other. But they stay together. That they stay together because they don't want to upset the kids or they don't want to give away their stuff. I would say another 75% stay together even though they want to get divorced. Okay, so let's say 20, so, so tw another 25% of yeah, married yeah, people, yeah, let's say. I mean, yeah. they're, they're, so, so now we've got a technology with a failure rate over 75%, <laughs> yeah, yeah. okay? So now, what percentage stay together for religious reasons? Probably a declining percentage over the years, but let's say, That's more. you know, 5%. But that might be the same as kids, and you know, it might, might be. be the same, yeah. So if I say yeah. there's a technology with a failure rate of 80%, Toyota, had a 0.0001% break failure. Oopsie. Nice save. <laughs> on their, uh, thank you. A 0.001% break failure on one of their vehicles, and they recalled all, all of, of the them. vehicles. Yeah. So if I said to you 80% 80, 80 <laughs> of technology, it, you, you and we, we still use it. Yeah, we, yeah. Not only do we use it, we celebrate its use. Yeah, it's part of our culture. And we're shamed if we're not married almost. Absolutely. Well, because it's, it's considered a sign that you're not mature and forward thinking. Mm -hmm. And we're ashamed when we're divorced. Right. But now we're being celebrated to get out of marriages if right. it's not what we want or if we're not getting what we want. That's, that's a trend that's definitely starting to change. So, so I it's think- It's like leave him, divorce him, or whatever, you know. Right. The, the well, I think as self-actualization, you know, became more of a thing, and, and, and after the 1970s, you know, people started thinking about, like, you know, themselves and their yeah. happiness. Yeah. It wasn't just about the unit anymore. It was about, you know, finding yourself then yeah, it became more acceptable to be self-interested. I'm not gonna say selfish, because not all self-interested behavior right, right. is selfish. Mm -hmm. But it became more acceptable to say, I'm not happy. You know, I married this person when I was 20, yeah. and now I'm 40, 
And shockingly, I'm not the same person at 40 that I was when I was 20. And now I'm a different person and it's no longer a good fit. You know, no. I mean, I, the, the analogy I tell people is, is if I said to you right now, you can have any car you want, what car would you have? Well, I just got a Tesla. I have a Tesla too. Yeah. yeah I actually crazy. don't Love care it. about cars at I'm all. I'm not a big car guy either. But I got one for tax reasons okay, actually. Okay, cool. And uh, I had a 1991, I still have a 1991 Cadillac Eldorado. Okay. That had like 60,000 miles on it. Okay. I just, I Uber car. everywhere. I don't really use it. It's a great car, it. yeah. yeah. Um, if you have I, any car you want. If you ask but I like the people. Tesla. I like the Tesla. Okay. Because it's fuel efficient. It's, you know, right. I just wish I had a bigger battery. So you're battery. a pragmatic guy. You ask it's most nice too, people. It's clean. You ask most people that question. They're gonna go Ferrari, Ferrari, Lamborghini. Lamborghini. I want yeah. a Maserati. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Now, if I then said to them, "Okay, you get one car, though. Yeah. Whatever car you pick, that's the car you're gonna have for the rest of your mm. life." Suddenly, a Lamborghini is a terrible idea because right. you can't put a car seat in it for a kid, no. yeah. and you can't, you know, when you're 80 years old, get into that car, right? Mm -hmm. So, if you are only allowed to have one car. You got to find a car that not only makes sense when you're 20 and 30 and 40, but when you're 70 yeah. and when you have kids and when the kids have gone away. So again, like a minivan that might make sense when you got three kids, when the kids go off to college, that minivan no longer makes sense. Well, marriage is a technology where you're signing on with one person and saying, for the rest of my life, I'm going to be with this person. And that's a very challenging thing. But here's the thing. I actually think people give more thought to the car they're buying than they do really to the technology of marriage and what about it specifically they mm. like or don't like. Mm. What training or information do you think, do you wish every couple would go through before signing up for the technology of marriage? That's a great question. I, I think, you know, if you buy a, a house, you get a lead paint disclosure, you get mm. a HUD disclosure that talks about the loan, you get all kinds of disclosures, right? You sign a will, there's all these pages that explain to you in great detail, you know, what's happening when you sign that will. You get married, you don't even get a pamphlet. <laughs> yeah. You don't even get like a one-page brochure that this says, is what by it the is. way, yeah. this is the most legally significant thing other than dying that you will ever do legally. And you don't get any information about what just happened. So the first thing I would say is I think everybody who's going to get married should have an hour consultation with a divorce lawyer. Absolutely. So they should go into your office. Before yes, but for a different reason. For a different reason. Yes, for prophylactically. Yes, yes, they yes. should come in proactively and learn about what's about to happen legally. What's about to happen to my rights? You know, what's about to, to, to change in terms of how I own property, the financial obligations I'll have to this person. I would also say one of the best things they could do is talk to someone candidly who's been married for an extended period of time. You know, that's not something we do. We're not encouraged. Mm -hmm. to be honest about our relationships. We're not. I mean, one of the things you talk about in Mask of Masculinity that I loved is about, particularly for men, but I think it's true for women too, we, we don't share candidly what's really going on mm -hmm. in our lives. We're, we're, we're in a very curated society where you put up on social media the best picture mm -hmm. and the best vacation photos and the best of everything we're doing and we don't share with each other the challenges. We don't share with each other even, even really relevant information. Mm -hmm. Like when I meet a couple who's been together for 20 years, I, you know, I want to know, I mean, I love the story, oh, how did you meet? And you know, kind of, yeah. how many times a week do you have sex? Mm -hmm. Who start, who initiates it? Do you ask, does she ask, do you always do the same stuff because you've been together for 20 years and you know what each other like? Or like, do you try like, do you like call an audible every once in a while? I'll just do some wacky thing. Yeah. Like, what is it? Like, what, are, what is it really like, the day-to-day -day of your relationship? And so many people, I mean, you've been in relationships, I've been in relationships, so many people just don't talk honestly. Even when I'm with my guy friends, you know, do we really yeah. talk honestly yeah. about the day-to-day -day of our relationships, the way we talk to the women in our lives, like the nickname they have for us or the nickname we have for them? Again, it's private to some degree information, but if we could share that stuff a little more, we'd have a, a lot more accurate of a perception of where our relationship stands in the scheme of things and mm -hmm. how we're doing. You know, because I, I really think there's this perception that people have of, you know, uh, oh, well, we're only having sex this many times a week. And it's like, well, okay, is that a lot? Is that too little? Like, you have nothing right. to compare it to. Right, right. You know, so in marriage, there's no way to know if you're doing well at it. Mm. Because you can't say, well, you know, we have fights every now and then. Well, okay, people have fights every now and then. But if you have a fight every week, that might be a lot. But how would you know? 
what would you compare it to? Right. So I would say one of the best things you can do to people who are considering getting married is put them in a room with people who've been good at that technology, who've managed to not only endure marriage, but endure it and still like it. And thrive. Right. Yeah, and thrive. Right. And still say, you know yeah. what, I'd sign on for this again. Yeah. Like in a room full of people, I'd still pick this person. Yeah. That's cool. You know, and, and, and how many of those opportunities do we really get mm. to talk to people that way about the relationship? Not many. Yeah. yeah. And maybe also talk to someone who's been through divorce and ask them Absolutely. what didn't work and why didn't it work and what and were where the did it to look break out down? for. Yeah. Exactly. See, one of the, the principles that inspired me to write the book was the idea that you know, again, I hate using car metaphors because I'm not a car guy either, but, <laughs> but it's the best analogy I can think of in the sense that if, if when you bought a car, you did every bit of preventative maintenance that a mechanic told you to do. Mm -hmm. You changed the oil every everything, two months right? or whatever. Yeah, yeah. my sister's everything. a dentist, yeah. you know, and, and she always says to me, by the time your tooth hurts, you're, you're screwed. Prevent it. Yeah. yeah. Floss you, every day, not right. after you if get you the cavity. If you do all yeah. the stuff she tells you to do when you go see her, your teeth are going to do well. Yeah. So it's, for me, who knows more about how a car breaks down than a mechanic, mm -hmm. right? So I, I know what, I know people are in my office and I get a very candid view of them and I get to talk to them and I have been very blessed that people trust me with tremendously personal information. And so what I wanted to do with that information is just find a way to leverage that into mm. some kind of wisdom yeah. that people could use and say, you know what, just don't do what they did. When we were talking about titles for the book, you know, it was mm. a, a hilarious escapade because, you know, one of the first ideas was, well, we'll call it everyone screwing everyone because it was mm. about how people just abuse each other in the process of divorce and oh, how they're man. really taking advantage of each other. And then we said, well, no, that's too pessimistic. And we said, well, you know, maybe we can, you know, just call it, you know, um, uh, vows and talk about like the promises that people make. But it's not really the promises that are interesting. It's the way that people go in with good intentions with those promises and yeah. they just can't keep it together. Can't keep it, yeah. So I really think that, that you know, for me, um, the best thing we can do with anybody is, is to, yeah, show them a model of success, right? And show them a model of failure. You know, and, and, and look, you've said it a million times on this show that you learn just as much from your successes as your failures. Mm -hmm. You might learn more from your failures even right. to some degree. Yeah. So we don't have those role models. We don't have relationship role models, you know. And, you know, one of the things you talked about masculine masculinity when you're talking about um, uh, Neil Strauss mm -hmm. um, and his marriage and how he says, look, it was my stuff. It wasn't like I said, oh, I don't like marriage because I don't like this about it. And I don't like that it for would force me to do this and force me to do that. And really what it was is he just didn't want to look at his own stuff. Yeah. And, and, and he felt like to have a good marriage, he'd have to look at his own stuff, which mm -hmm. is absolutely true. <laughs> yeah. you know? and, and terrifying. And, and yeah. Most of what my book is about is about, yeah, you got to look at your stuff. Yeah. If you want to be successful in this technology, you got to look at it, own it, and share it with this mm -hmm. person. And be aware and be honest with the person about who you are and what you, right. what you want, what you don't want. Right. Now, you were, you were married for how long? I was married for 12 years. 12 years, yeah. got divorced. Yep, got divorced. While you were a divorce attorney. Yes, while I was a divorce attorney. So you're hearing these stories every day. And going through Going it. through your marriage. But you know, my, yeah, I mean, my marriage, I think benefited from my experience as a divorce lawyer. Because you knew the cues of what not to do or what yes. was gonna work. But it, it was hurt by the fact that I love what I do for a living and was so consumed with it that I worked constantly. Mm. Um, you know, my ex-wife, who is one of my dearest friends to this day, oh, she's remarried to an amazing guy who's a, a great stepdad to my sons who are now older. They're, they're both in college. Um, but I'm very blessed. I mean, I've, I've had an experience of divorce where I, I'm still close friends with her. I'm, clo I'm friends with her husband. Um, you know, and I, I, I'm very lucky for that. Because I look at it like, there's a lot of people I love that I wouldn't want to be married to. Sure. And she's one of them. She's someone I love. She's someone I appreciate who I think is just an amazing person. But we don't have the chemist, the exact ingredients that you need to be successful in marriage. Long term, because yeah. we met when we were 17. Mm -hmm. And what we wanted when we were 17, 18, 19, 22 when we got married, 24 when we had kids, when we turned around and we're in our 30s, we went, you know, we don't actually have that much in common. And so either I'm going to have to stop 
being who I actually am. Like, I love to travel. You don't love to travel. You love, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, from silly things. You love yeah. shabby chic furniture, and I like very zen aesthetics, yeah, you yeah. know? Like, you love this kind of movie, and I love this kind of movie. And you reach a point where you kind of go, well, do we white knuckle it now because we don't want to quit something that isn't working? Or do we say, you know what, let's call this. Let's call this, and let's find someone who feeds us in the right way and, and, and see if, or, or just be alone for the right reasons, you know? Right. And I'm very blessed that the person who I was married to was mature enough to see it the same way and to have that painful but really wonderful conversation that mm. so few people can have. Mm. And that is to say, look, this, this thing was successful. You know, we, we, we both are leaving this better people than we were when we came into it. Mm -hmm. And we're leaving it with two kids that are, are the exact chemistry of the two of us and they're right. made up of the two of yeah. us. But we're gonna kind of take our different paths now and let's still love each other. Let's still respect each yeah. other. Let's, Conscious uncoupling, let's yeah. call it, right? Absolutely, I mean, that's the term that's been handed yeah. to it. But you know, the truth is, is I think people have been doing it for years. You just don't hear about it. Mm -hmm. It's not that, my divorce is the least interesting thing about me. <laughs> right. It really is. Yeah. Like if I said to you, like, you know, tell me 10 things about yourself. The, the fact that I'm divorced wouldn't make a list mm. because the fact that I tried to Marry someone and stay with them forever and it didn't work out isn't that interesting. It's not that unique. Mm. You know, what you hear about, in, the people who talk about their divorces incessantly are people who were wounded by them. Yeah. And, and now they've been victimized by their divorce. Yeah. And so it becomes a tremendous part of their identity. And they it hold becomes, on to it for a while and they talk about it and here's absolutely. what happened. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and so, you know, they're the, the silent you know, there's a huge number of people that had divorces like mine, where the marriage just ended, it ended yeah. in a friendly fashion, they continue to co-parent successfully together and they mm -hmm. both live their lives. There's not this pain and no. resentment for years. No. And no, and I have to tell you, as a divorce lawyer, as a practicing divorce lawyer, a huge, I would say more than 50% of the people that I represent, it's that kind of transaction. Really? It really is that it's just two people that their time is done and now we just have to figure out how to divide up the things they have and work out the schedules with the kids. That's good That's to the know, majority. 50%. Yeah. yeah, I would say at least 50%. That's good. But, but the thing is, the other 50% are louder. Are so much right. more interesting. Yeah. I mean, so much. It's like, because really, who wants to hear about, like, oh, I talked to my ex-wife yesterday, and she's, yeah, she's, she's lovely. Yeah, you yeah. know, she's, <laughs> she's moving to Rochester soon. Like, we're just, you know, that's her life. It's the it, drama and the yeah, train she wreck. she threw a, a bat at me. She <laughs> set my car on fire. Like, it's way more interesting, you know? <laughs> oh, man. Um, do you feel like, you know, marriage... I hear this all the time. It's something that's not going to be easy, right? Mm -hmm. There's going to be challenges. There's going to be fights mm -hmm. or arguments, and there's sure. going to be some things that you're not going to agree on. Sure. If you ground everything, awesome. But it doesn't yeah. sound like yeah. there's many marriages that are yeah. always perfect and yeah. always smooth. Yeah. After 10, 20, 30 years, mm -hmm. there's going to be some conflict. Mm -hmm. So does that mean, in your opinion, that we should just be like, you know what, let's just throw in the towel when it gets too challenging. Or, you know what, it's getting challenging, that's when we gotta dive in deeper and like come together as a marriage because we signed up for this. It's a, it's a great question. I would say the following. I, I think one of the most common things people will say to you about marriage is, you know, marriage is hard, marriage is hard. I, I don't know that that's true. I, I, I think if you consider paying attention hard, Mm -hmm. then marriage is hard. Right. If you don't consider paying attention hard, then I don't think marriage has to be hard. Right. I, I think that it's again, not to, to use the metaphor again, but you know, losing weight is harder than maintaining your weight. And I really think, you're, look, you're gonna have challenges. Mm -hmm. You're not necessarily gonna have fights, you're gonna have challenges. Life is gonna throw challenges in your way, illness. Adversity, career issues, you know, day-to-day uh, -day miscommunications with each other. Mm -hmm. If you're not paying attention, those things get huge. Mm -hmm. And then the big, big things happen. So people come in and they go, I'm getting divorced because he's sleeping with his secretary. You are. That's a great reason to get divorced and that's a legit thing. He's, not, he's sleeping with his secretary because there's something wrong in the marriage. Yeah. That, you know, and you, if you don't want to look at that, because you have some culpability in that. And it's easier to just go, oh, this His harlot came and took him yeah. away. And it's a lot easier to say that. Yeah. But the truth is, 
you know, you stopped paying attention, you know, and, and this is the question I find myself when I have a minute, you know, with a client who I've been some miles with. Mm -hmm. And we're sitting outside of the, you know, the, the courtroom waiting for the case to be called. And I have enough of a rapport with them and we've been enough of a distance together that I feel like I can be candid with them. I'll say to them, was there a moment where you realized your marriage was over? Mm. What, what was that moment, you know? And you would be amazed at the insight if people think about that question that they give to you. I had a woman who said to me, and it, it was, a, to me, a very powerful example. I, I discuss it a little bit in the book. She said um, there was a kind of granola that she liked. And, and you could only get it at like a certain store, like a Whole Foods or something like that. And um, her husband used to always buy it. He used to always buy it. Whenever she was running low, she would just open the cabinet and there'd be another bag of it there. And she, she loved that. Mm. Because he didn't say like, oh, and look, honey, I bought your granola. Like, I get credit for that. You know, like, he just would do it. He just saw that this was something that he was paying attention. He just saw that there was this little thing. And it was this little kindness that he showed yeah. her yeah. that let her know she was important to him. He was still kind of trying to woo her without being obvious about it. And he was still paying attention. And she said then one day, she just ran out of the granola and it wasn't there. So she thought, oh, well, maybe he's like busy and he just didn't notice. So she kind of left the bag out. And, you know, sure enough, he, he still didn't replace the granola. And she said she had a, a, a tangible memory. It was about a year before the actual divorce. But she said she had a tangible memory where she thought, okay, this is over. You know, this thing wow. is over now. And I think that that's the thing. That's kind of, right. if, if you boiled my book down, one of the things I say to people is, there's this thing in every relationship, some little thing that you, had to, that you did for your partner or some little thing that you just had to tell them that at some point you just stop telling them. Yeah. You know, I don't know if it's, it's just in the morning saying like, God, you're so pretty when she walks by or if it's her saying to you like, you know, oh, I love your, your strong arms yeah. or whatever it might be. Like there's just those little things. Like we, we just want someone cheering for us. We just want, why do we, why do we get together? We want connection. We just want connection. Mm -hmm. Like there's no other reason to get married yeah. other than wanting connection. So those little disconnections, add that's, up. that's the up. ad, you know, yeah. and that's, it's death by a thousand paper cuts, mm -hmm. you know, and that's the challenge for me is, 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 is that's what people need to sort of find their way to connect yeah. to again. Yeah. What do you think are the most important things to find out about your spouse before getting married? See, I'm super pragmatic about that. I think you're going to be living with somebody. So I think you should, you should know some bare bones things. Right, like right. I want to know, can you go to bed with a dish in the sink still? Mm. Or are you somebody that like needs to have the dishes clean? What time do you go to bed? What time do you like to wake up in the morning? Are you a loud morning person or a quiet morning person? Mm. Do you, you know, uh, how do you feel like what, how do you feel about credit card debt? How do you feel about a very pragmatic question? How many times a week do you think you should have sex when you're married for you to be satisfied? You know, mm. these are the kinds of questions like mm -hmm. if I'm signing up to live with another human being, to share my finances with them, and to only have sex with them for the rest of my life, these are yeah. important questions. Yeah. I mean, for real, like why would you buy a car and, oh, I don't know how many miles it is, or I don't know how many doors it has. Yeah. Like these are basic or questions. Or if it's going to turn on when I turn it, try to right. turn it on. Yeah, yeah. Right, like just ask some fundamental, honest questions. Mm. And, and, and look, there's nothing wrong with asking those questions. There's nothing, yes. we've convinced people that this idea of like a soulmate, right. that you should just meet someone, instant chemistry, and if you don't have instant chemistry and perfection, you're doing it wrong. And so you're, you're discouraged from asking pragmatic, practical questions yeah. like, listen, how many times a week do you think you should have sex? Or how many times a week? Because if you had those conversations, not only are you gonna go into the relationship with your eyes open, but it's going to allow you to actually serve the needs of your spouse a little bit better. Like if I know what, See what you she went, wants or he wants, it. right? Yeah. Like now I know, um, you know, it's as advertised. You know, this is what you said you wanted, and I know am I meeting that standard or am I not meeting that standard? Right. And if I'm not, we can have a conversation about, hey, listen, just so you know, this is why I'm not that way anymore. You know, because very often if you talk to women about, you know, why did they stop sleeping with their husband or husbands about why did you stop being interested in your wife, they'll tell you the reason. You know, they'll say like, oh yeah, he just, well, he stops being complimentary to me and now he just wants, like, he only hugs me when he wants to have sex. Like, if he hugged me more often, I would probably feel more romantic towards him. If you'd had that conversation, you wouldn't get to the, you know, this, this war that no one wins. You know, well, you're not hugging me anymore, so now I'm not going to sleep with you. Well, now I don't feel affectionate towards you because you're not sleeping with me. Right. 
Oh, well, now I feel even more upset with you because you're not sleeping with me. Well, now I'm going to start sleeping with somebody else. And now we're just off to the races. And meanwhile, we had two people that signed on for the same task that now have completely lost the plot. Mm. You know, and that to me, I mean, one of the things I, I love about divorce law is in this culture where we're so full of it. You know, we're so, we don't want to admit when we screwed up. We don't want to admit when we're lost. We're terrified to admit when we're lost. To, to have, you, no one meant to get divorced. You can't pretend. Yeah. You're in this beautifully raw situation. Anyone who is in my office, they did not mean to be there. And, and there's something to me really beautiful about that because it's this opportunity to just say, you know what, like, I, yeah, we tried to do this thing and it, it fell apart. And so to me, that's, that can be beautiful. That's an mm. opportunity for growth. You know, the barns burned down, now I can see the moon, you know? Right. And I really feel like, that's the, 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 the thing that if people could have that level of honesty and candor and realness in marriage, they, they wouldn't end up in marriage. Yeah. When, you, when a couple is starting to lose connection, what do you think they can do to get reconnected? I think the, I mean, the core is communication. Just start yeah. talking. You know, yeah. just start. I, I, I yeah. talk about ways to have that conversation, you know, very pragmatic, practical. Like, mm -hmm. I didn't want to write a book that was filled with conclusions mm -hmm. of lofty, so you need to reconnect with your partner. What the hell does that mean? You know, like when your partner says, um, you know, I want to feel more fulfilled. What does that mean? Like, do you, do you mean you want to have a date night once a week or do you mean you want to surf more often? Because I don't know if I should take you out to dinner or drive you to the beach. Right. Like, what, what <laughs> does that specific. mean? Yeah, yeah. Specifically. And so, you know, I, I think People need to know how to talk to each other. And in fact, why not have a conversation about how you have conversations? Like, why not talk about, listen, when there's a problem in the marriage, how are we going to talk to each other about it? And one of the things, there's a chapter in there called Hit Send Now. And it's about just this very simple idea. And that is, send an email to your partner. You know, hits, the, the reason I call it Hit Send Now is that I always thought it's kind of funny when you, you hit send on an email. You can't hit like unsend. Mm -hmm. Like it's just, you hit it and you're like, oh wow, okay, it's out there now, you know? <laughs> and I've had emails where I'm like, you know, I write my email and I'm like, Phew, okay, there it is. Like I can't take it back now, you know? And it's kind of exciting, but it's yeah. also kind of terrifying. Yeah. And I think the idea of hit send now is to, is to say like, listen, when some little thing's going on in the marriage that you don't, you know that this could be an issue someday, but you don't want to, you know, write an email. Write an email to the person and say like, hey, listen, when we were sitting around last night and we were having dinner and you kind of made that little comment about my sister, like, I don't know if you meant it or not, but like, it kind of hurt, you know, it made me feel really weird because I always thought you liked my sister. And so I don't know, I just wanted to let you know, you know, mm. and, and, and see, unlike a conversation, if we have that in a conversation, you immediately are going to be defensive. defensive. Well, wait a minute. No, no. I bet. And by the way, you may not be ready to have that conversation. Right. You might have other things going on in your brain. You might. So an email is great because it, it, it gives a person a chance to digest it. It gives them a chance to sort of think it through, not Read be immediately, through it, yeah. right, not not be immediately defensive. Yeah, yeah. And what I even say to people is make the subject heading hit send now. Because that way the person goes, oh, it's going to be one of these emails. Okay, like brace myself for it. Like be ready that this is what this is. Yeah. And you can time when you send it. Send it when you know you're not going to see them. You're going to be out of the blast radius. And you're going to give them a chance to digest it, mm -hmm. you know. Send it to them in the morning when you know they're sharp or at night when you know they're calm. Whatever, you, you know, hopefully you know your partner well enough to know, like, what's the time to talk to them before they go to the gym or after they get back from the gym. You know, if you want to ask me something, ask after I get back from Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu class because I'm, like, calm as a Hindu cow, yeah, yeah. you know. <laughs> but if you see me on a, a Friday morning when I've got court, like, this is not the time to talk to me about relationship issues. Yeah. So I, I would say the, the best thing people can do is communicate in a very clear way with each other. Mm -hmm. That's going to be that's going to solve ninety percent of the problems yeah. that you have. And yeah. most of this book is just about ways to communicate with each other and ways to to you know own your stuff and help your partner own their stuff. Because I still believe that 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 relationships, maybe not marriage, but marriage at its best, is about having someone who sees your blind spots. Yeah. You know, we, we're, we're better together as human beings. Mm -hmm. We're better in connection. We're better when we have the benefit of each other's perspective and when we help each other see the things that we just can't see about ourselves. Yeah, know? it's true. What would you say are the top three reasons people get divorced? Is it infidelity? Or is it financial? Is it something else? Yeah, I mean, the top three big reasons. Mm -hmm. um, again, you know, Obviously with the, the idea that the little things yeah, yeah. add up and cause these things. But yeah, absolutely infidelity would be number one. 
Finances would be number two. Um, and number three would be, I would just call it attrition. It would just be, you know, that relationships just, they just burn just up. Like people just don't care anymore. Yeah. You know, the opposite of love isn't hate. It's contempt, right? It's indifference. Indifference. I mean, hate is a passionate emotion. Like, if you hate me, you, have, you feel strongly about it. If you me. just don't care anymore. Right. Like, you know, there's a line in Casablanca, the movie where, you know, the, uh, one of the characters says to Humphrey Bogart's character, he says, boy, you really hate me. And he says to him, you know, I, I suppose if I gave you any thought, I probably would. And I, I found in my, when I saw that film, I thought, oh, that's the most cutting insult. Because when you really just don't care, like that's the opposite of love. Because love is about, I'm paying attention. I want to please you. Your pleasure gives me pleasure. Your joy gives me joy. Your sadness becomes my burden. Mm. You know, and it becomes something I want to alleviate. So indifference, that sense of, I don't care what you're doing. I don't care if you're happy, I don't care if you're sad, I don't care. That's the thing. And, and that's where people land sometimes. Mm. You know, as they just land in that place where, where they used to care and then in this escalating war of, well, I shouldn't have to do that. Well, I shouldn't have to do this. Well, I shouldn't have to do that. Well, then I shouldn't have to do that. And now you got two people that are just, great, you guys won. Good job. Neither of you <laughs> has to do anything for each other anymore. Right. Great job. Yeah. Great job. You're living with a person who owes you nothing and you owe them nothing except what the state tells you that you owe each other. Wow. And you're never meant to be there. You're never mm. meant to be there. Yeah. Wow. Uh, what's the best way to handle financial stress in your opinion? Financial stress? Yeah. Um, don't get into it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, no, the best way to handle financial stress, again, I think candor. You know, yeah. just candor. Probably honesty. communicating it before you get married Absolutely. about these things so you don't get into it. Absolutely. Again, it, what's the best way to lose weight? Don't get fat. Yeah. You know, I mean, the truth is, is try to find a way to prevent getting in that place. But look, once you've got financial stress, so, so there are financial mm -hmm. stresses you can't prevent. You yeah. know, you lose yeah. your job. Your company lays off 500 people and you're one yeah. of you them. You get a medical challenge right. that happens. Yeah, something. Okay, so how do you deal with it? Yeah. Well, you, with candor, with courage, you know, with honesty, with, you know, um, with fearlessness, mm -hmm. you know, with bluntness. I mean, one of the things I, I, like I said, I love about your book, and that's why I said I think the two books together would actually be a great mm -hmm. combination. If you know a guy who's getting married, you buy him your Give book him and buy him my yeah. book, and I think you Good just drop the statistics yeah. down on these guys. Yeah. Because the truth is, 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 you know, knowing your stuff and being fearless enough uh -huh. to say this is what it is, that's, that's where the magic is. Yeah, you know? yeah. I saw one of the chapters says yours, mine, and ours, the financial right. system that works right. best. Yeah. So I think a lot of people have their own way of how they want to run their money. Right. Right? right. They like managing it their way, spending yeah. it on the things they want to yeah. spend it on. Yeah. Some like getting in debt, others yeah. don't like getting in debt. So yeah. how do you find our way? Well, I mean, you got to keep in mind, marriage was created as a technology, right? When was it when created? When women were property, essentially. I mean, it was created in medieval context. I mean, it was created essentially to, to you know, preserve wealth. It was created to preserve lands, right? R royal families would marry each other and rich families would marry each other to preserve land, you know, and to bring clans together. You know, the Game of Thrones mentality of, all right, I'm marrying this person, not because I love them, but because this makes sense. This family makes sense. This, this uni union of the clans makes sense. It's our vision. Yeah, right, yeah. okay. So that's the origin of marriage. Now at some point, you know, 1920s, 1930s, it started turning into some romantic notion, right? Some notion of, well, I should have some... The movies. The right, movies brought that in. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, it's entirely possible. I mean, entertainment media is very much how yeah. people perceive, you know, advertising is the dream life of a culture. Yeah. You know, like, we, we started to convince people that, you know, marriage should be more about love, it should be more about romance. And, and then, you know, people became consumed by that model. Why? It's a compelling model. It's mm -hmm. a wonderful model. I mean, there's nothing more exciting than the initial days of a relationship. You know, some, somebody once said that there's nothing more exciting than getting married and nothing harder than being married. You know, and so getting married, super fun. Courtship, those early days of a relationship, they're fantastic. They're fantastic. There's so many people you could have a really wonderful early relationship yeah, with. Right. But how many people could you have 10, 20, 30, 40 years with? So, you know, when you think about the fact that marriage was put together when women couldn't own property, when women were essentially sold. I mean, you'd Couldn't buy, a, you'd, you'd trade right. a cow for the guy's daughter. Wow. I mean, that was what it was. There's, there's, there's still Crazy. cultures where trade five livestock for my daughter, and that's Crazy. the trade, you know? So now we're in a society where we've kept the same technology that was rooted in that. But 
we're in a place where men and women are both in the workforce. Men and women both have obviously independent autonomous value and they're, and they're equals, at least in a theoretical sense, right? Even though there's still some inequality and patriarchy and things people have to figure out and deal with. The truth is, is that men and women have equality of opportunity, ideally. So now, well, what makes sense? You're, you're no longer bringing together this overreaching man who's in charge and goes to work and this woman who's going to stay home and tend to the hearth, you know, and the children. You know, we have two intelligent, autonomous, mm -hmm. you know, man and woman. And I didn't get into it in the book, but men and men and women yeah. and women. I mean, yeah. we have marriage equality now. We yeah. fought really hard for it so that, you know, a, a gay couples and lesbian couples could have the privilege of this failing technology, <laughs> you know? And so we said, why should, why should we have all the misery? Why? Everybody <laughs> sign up, <laughs> right. you know? And I've secretly believed that there were probably, you know, gay and lesbian individuals who'd been with their partners for long periods of time and secretly voted against marriage equality really? so they wouldn't have to have the conversation. You know, because if you think about it, when they, were, when they weren't able to, they could be like, oh, I'd love to marry you, but oh, the <laughs> government won't let me, I wish, <laughs> oh, and then all of a sudden it's like, great, the government's letting us. You're like, oh, okay, well, I guess we have to have that conversation now. Mm. So I really do think that, that, that from a financial place, Yours, mine, and ours, the basic idea of it is just to say, look, have some joint finances. Have yeah. some sense of, we'll have this account that joint money goes into, we'll pay for joint expenses from it. But then have some autonomy. Have mm -hmm. your own individual accounts. Have, have something that you can use to, when you want to buy the other person a birthday present. I mean, if you have right. a joint account and I buy you a birthday present from that no account, surprise. I bought myself a birthday <laughs> present. So, you know, let a person have a little autonomy financially, but, but have a joint account so there's still some sense of shared purpose financially. Yeah, yeah. You know? I like that. <laughs> um, what, do, what do you think is the real reason people cheat on each other? Is it these little things that have added up over time that people yeah. aren't paying attention to? I mean, I think at its core, it's the human need for connection. Mm. I mean, I think Esther Perel and, you know, there's a she's lot incredible. of people. She's incredible. Incredible. Yeah. I, I, I love her work and I love the way she do thinks about things. Do you know her personally things. or not? I don't. No. And I, I've, I've secretly said to everyone, to do connects. a panel with her would be the coolest be thing in the world. Yeah, the future of marriage. You know, we really, because she has such incredible perspective and she mm -hmm. comes at it from this mental health perspective and she comes at it from a really like a hacker mentality. Yeah. I don't think she realizes it, but she is like, she wants to uber marriage. Mm -hmm. Like she's thinking about like, well, why don't we do it different? Like what, instead of, you know, she's got that Silicon Valley approach, which is don't look at how we did it. Look at it and go, well, wait, what if we just ripped the technology apart mm -hmm. and started from nothing? What could yeah. we do with it? You know, and, and I love that about her. And mm -hmm. I love Mating Captivity. I think it was like, it was just a genius piece of work. Yeah. And again, I think if people understood those concepts before they got married or even thought about them, you'd already be a step ahead of the game because identifying the problem is a huge piece of, of the problem is that mm -hmm. people never identify it. Yeah. But I would say that, that you know, um, I totally forgot the question. Uh, about love, <laughs> about love. I mean, I mean about cheating. And cheating, yeah. So I, I, think, I think cheating is a function of losing that connection. Yeah. yeah. And I also think it's about a human need for physical intimacy, physical uh -huh. attention, physical attraction. I am not someone who believes, you know, I, I think John Gray, for example, did great work, is super intelligent with his ideas of, you know, men are from Mars, women are from Venus, and that, you know, men are like a microwave and women are like a slow cooker, you know, and that it takes us different sexually times to heat up and stuff. I think some of that was tied to some sexual mores. Yeah, there's some biochemistry there, mm -hmm. but I think the truth is, is that women are now really becoming permitted to own their sexuality. Yeah, yeah. We've become a more sex positive culture. Yeah. A lot of that misogyny that, that was motivating women to not be sexual beings, you know, it started to fall apart. I don't know if it was Kim Cattrall and, and Sex in the City and Samantha, right, or if, right. it was, if it was just this, this, this long term thing. But I think men and women are very sexual. I see men who cheat, I see women who cheat. Um, I see men who've been cheated on, I see women who've been cheated on, and I can tell you men don't cheat more than women, women don't yeah, cheat more than yeah. men. And Esther said that too, I mean women cheat just as women much. Women cheat just as much. They, they, in my experience, do it more intelligently usually than <laughs> men. Um, but yeah, they, they, they're not as impulsive or impetuous about right, it. Right. But it really, you know, infidelity happens because people have a need, a sexual need, you mm -hmm. know, and they have a need, and sex is, you know, uh, I think uh, they, they attribute it to Oscar Wilde, but I don't think it's a fair, uh, I don't think it actually came from him. Um, I don't think they know who said it, but they said that everything, everything in life is about sex except for sex, which is about power. Mm. And I think the truth of sex is that um, sex is a way we share our affection for each other. 
It's a way that we share our attraction to another person. And when that starts to fall away in a relationship, mm -hmm. then people cheat. The and connection, the, yeah, yeah. The question is, is how do you maintain that connection? Because that's why people cheat. Yeah. People, people who have happy, functional, active sex lives with their partner, and they're really truly fulfilled by it, and they maintain intimacy. You know, intimacy is defined as the ability to be yourself with another person. So it's not about sex. Intimacy is, you know, intimacy, sex is, is ideally tied to intimacy, but you know, you can have great intimacies and not have a sexual relationship with someone. You and I as friends can have tremendous intimacy. Yeah. I can be myself with you, you can be yourself with me. But sex is a tremendous way for people to build intimacy and sustain intimacy. You know, there are people say, you know, sex is the glue. You know, it's the glue that holds it together. Because what is it? It's the thing that separates a, 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 a lover friendship. from a roommate. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it prevents it from just being, because if you just want to have a roommate, have a roommate. Yeah. You know, it's the sex that's the pillar of marriage, yeah. you know. And so how do we maintain sexual connection with someone, satisfying sexual connection? Again, it's not about how do I stay married? Easy, don't get divorced. Yeah. You know, how do I stay happily married? That's a much harder question. Mm. How do I keep having sex with the same person? Not a hard question to answer, just keep having sex with them. How do I have satisfying sex with that person that's going to fill my needs and is going to prevent me from wanting to go have sex with other people? That's a more interesting question. Mm. Yeah. Well, how do you do that? After 10, I can tell you years. how you don't do it. How you don't do it is by not sharing with the person what you really want. There's yeah. a chapter in the book called Go Without or Go Elsewhere, where I basically say that if you don't share every sexual desire you have with the one person you're allowed to have sex with, you're an idiot. Because you're either going to go without it then, or you're going to go elsewhere to get and it. And resent it. Yeah, yeah, and resent it. Or you're going to have to go elsewhere and then potentially ruin the relationship. Mm -hmm. You know, I talk about, you know, a, a client I had who was in defeat, you know, in a sexual way. And again, it's not my thing, you know, I'm not a foot guy. I mean, like, right, right. to me, feet and sex, it's like, I use my feet to get to bed to have right, sex. Right. But other than that, the feet don't get into it. But this was this guy's thing, he loved feet. And in a really like intense way, like this was sexually, it was a fetish for him. Yeah. And, and, and you know, you and I laugh at it, but the truth is it's right. actually a pretty generic thing apparently. Yeah. Like Google people, it, it's a pretty people generic like thing. It, yeah. People like it, and, and you know what? Attraction is so hard to understand. Desire is so yeah. hard to understand. Why do any of us like what we like? It's the reason why I've just never been homophobic. Because until I can articulate to you why I like what I like, I, how could I possibly judge you for the things that you like? Mm -hmm. You know, so the, the truth is that that you know, sexual desire, you know, is so complex, you know, and so hard to understand, you know, that that we we don't realize that there's a, a tremendous value in just identifying what you want and sharing yeah. it with your partner. Right. And I say in the book, don't. Just in the middle of sex, like if you, you know, if you want your partner to talk dirty, you know, there's a very common thing is people like to, to talk dirty or to have someone talk dirty to them. All right, mm -hmm. maybe we watch too much porn and that's why we feel that way, or maybe in the romantic films that people, you know, speak sexually to each other and that's why. Whatever is there, maybe there's just something in us that likes the sound of our partner's voice, but we're like afraid to say something. Mm -hmm. You know, we're afraid. To, or whatever, yeah. Right, you're embarrassed. You don't want the person to be like, wait, what? What the hell's wrong? You know, you don't <laughs> want that to happen. So you hold it in. You don't say anything about mm -hmm. it. Who are you serving there? No Maybe this is their fantasy too. You know, you have to be, but but again, what I what I say in the book is that people have great intentions and cause tremendous problems in their their sexual relationships. Yeah. So the following example is is the best one I can think of. So you're 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 with this sexual partner for you know initially, and initially you're having tons of sex and it's great sex. It's all new and it's exciting and. What starts to happen? You start to learn what the other one likes, right? You start to figure out, okay, she likes this and he likes this and I do this first and then that warms up for this and this is great. And that's part of the fun of early days is figuring out, you know, what the other person likes. Mm -hmm. Well, then what starts to happen? Then you go, hey, listen, let's play the greatest hits, right? I know that this they love and this they kind of could care less, so I'm just going to do the greatest hits. I'm just going to, and you have good intentions. I mean, you really... You're trying to do the right thing. You're, they're going to do your greatest hits. You're going to do their greatest hits. And everybody's going to be so excited in a much shorter period of time. And we'll be done before John Oliver comes on. You know, whatever it is. You know. So then what happens? Six months, a year, two years of just doing the greatest they hits. They get boring. Starts to get right. I mean, I, I get an album I like, and I yeah. love this song. I love that song. So much. Play it a hundred times. I mean, when when you know Zero to Hundred by Drake came out, I probably listened yeah. to it a thousand times. Right? Okay, so many times that then when I played it again, I'm like, oh my god, I can't hear this yeah, song yeah. again. So the truth is, 
people with really good intentions create a sex life that creates discontent in their sex life. Mm -hmm. So then what happens though? That's, that's the key moment. What do you do? Well, if you're smart, you say, hey, you know what? Like we're kind of always doing the same things. Let's, let's change it up. Let's do something different. You hit send now. You send that email. Mm. And you say, hey, you know, maybe I'd like to, again, don't just call an audible in the middle of sex because the person's going to start to go like, well, where did that come from? Like we've been doing the greatest hits and yeah. all of a sudden you did this random thing, you know? Let them think about it. Let them, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the example of talking dirty, which I think is a pretty ubiquitous, simple kind of an example. Don't just start like straight up porn dialogue in your partner's <laughs> ear if you've been silent all these years. Right. Maybe say one or two little things and see what the reaction is. Gauge the reaction. You know, touch them in some body uh -huh. part you haven't before. See what the reaction is. And, and then have a conversation after about, oh, did you like that when we did that? Or, oh, did you, you know, I kind of threw that in there. What did you think of that? You know, that's the kind of communication that mm -hmm. I think prevents people from losing the plot, being stagnant, even with good intentions and losing their sexual desire and attraction to the mm -hmm. person that they're with. Yeah. Because that is at the core, I have to tell you, of so many people who come in my office. They talk really? about, we stopped sleeping together six months, we stopped sleeping together three years ago, we wow. haven't had sex in five years. No people way. come into five my years? office where I had somebody come into my office, no joke, last month said they hadn't had sex with their partner in eight years. What? Eight years. Your roommate. You're, yeah, you're a point, roommate. You're a, roommate you're a miserable roommate oh at that point. No, because even a roommate, there's no expectation of sex. Right. Like, you don't want to see your roommate and go like, wow, we haven't had sex in a while. You're not supposed to have sex with your roommate. Yeah. But you're supposed to have sex with, with your sexual partner. You're supposed to have sex with your spouse. And by the way, if we haven't had sex in eight years, can you get mad when I have sex with someone else? That seems wildly unfair, you know? So mm. that's the trick. But, 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 you know, the answer to that is, yes, you do have a right to be upset at that if we've never had a conversation about why we're not having sex, mm -hmm. you know, and not figured that out. Because a lot of times it's, the again, those little things. Look, mm. anyone who's been in a relationship knows that you, you sit with your partner and you're having a conversation about, you know, the best way to get onto this highway from this particular place. And it turns into a slight disagreement. And 10 minutes later, it's, you know, I never liked your mother. Oh, man. And it's like, wait, what? How did we just <laughs> get there? But anyone who's in a relationship knows you, the fight was about one thing. And then it turned into some other much bigger, deeper thing. So it's the same thing when it comes yeah. to infidelity. Yeah. It, 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 you know, there was one conversation happening in the relationship about sex, and then all of a sudden you turn around and you're completely in a different place and you mm. lost the plot. Yeah. I was at a Cirque du Soleil uh, show over the weekend in Vegas, and it was Zumanity, which is like mm. the sexual, like, lovey, you know, sure. sensual one. Sure. And the uh, host of the show, the drag queen, was asking questions to people who were looked like couples. Right. Like, how long have you been married? How long have you been married? Are you married? Are you together? Right. And uh, the drag queen asked one of the, the couples and was like, how long have you guys been married? And he said, we're, we're not married, but we're life partners. Mm -hmm. And she goes, well, what does that mean? Right. And, then, and then the guy took the mic and he said, we're not allowing the government or the state to dictate our relationship. Sure. Sure. I thought that was interesting perspective. Yeah. yeah. You know, what are all the things that the government or the state actually dictates when you sign a contract sure. of marriage? Yeah, and you know, the funny thing is, is isn't it amazing that you live in a culture where marriage is everywhere and you don't know the answer to that? No, no and I'm not saying you specifically. Yeah, yeah. Nobody but, knows yeah, yeah. the answer to that. Like, I know probably 20 engaged people who don't know the answer to that. Mm. You know, whoever discovered water, it wasn't a fish. You know, and, and what happens in these situations is people are so surrounded by marriage as a technology that they don't ever stop and ask the question, like, wait a minute, what, by the way, what legally happens when I get married? So, I mean, what legally happens when you get married is, A, you opt out of the title system. So, you know, I have a car, system? it's in my name. It's titled in my name. I have a bank account, it's titled in my name. So title is the legal term for when someone's name is on something. Okay. So if you and I are friends, and you own a car and it's in your name and I own a car and it's in my name, I can't go, I'm taking your car now, Lewis, because your car is in your name, mm -hmm. so you have proof of ownership of it, okay? If I say, you know, Lewis, I've bought a car, I have a Tesla, you have a Tesla, it's silly that we both have Teslas, let's share a Tesla. 
So I'll put your name on my Tesla. And now we both are titled owners of that Tesla. Mm -hmm. Well, now if you and I have a parting of ways, we have to divide that Tesla somehow. Mm -hmm. And the law says, okay, we'll divide that based on how much you put into it and how much who repaired it or who fixed it up. So there's all kinds of ways to determine how the ownership interest, just like a business. If we right. start a business together, right. it's in your name, it's in my name, how are we gonna divide it up? When you marry, you immediately opt out of the title system. So if it's in my name, it's ours. If it's in your name, it's ours. Whatever if it's one person in, owns, both no people own. If I buy my wife a Rolex watch, I bought myself one half of a Rolex watch. Mm -hmm. If I get $10,000 in credit card debt, my spouse just got $5,000 in credit card wow. debt. So you're opting out of this. So no one knows that. You're now opting in to certain systems regarding a lifestyle. So you're opting into systems about um, you know, maintaining spousal support or alimony. Okay, what used to be called alimony is now called spousal maintenance okay, or spousal support. And that is a system whereby if one person is an earner and the other person's less of an earner, that if there's a, a split between those people, that one person has to now make payments to the other person to maintain them in a certain level of lifestyle or rehabilitate their earning capacity. For life? No, not necessarily for mm -hmm. life. Every state has different formulas as to how they do things and every state has different you know, numbers and percentages and how many years you have to be married before uh, uh, you know, the, the right to alimony kicks in. But again, people don't know those things when they sign up. Mm -hmm. like, you don't, people when they get married in New York State don't know, oh, 17% of my gross income less FICA is my child support exposure if I have a child, one child, 25% if I have two. You know, people don't learn that. You don't get a piece of paper when you get married that explains that to you. You're signing up for a contract you don't know the terms of. You know, and again, I think you're just sort of assuming that it's a fair contract. You haven't read it, but you just assume it's a fair contract. Getting married is like when you just agree to the terms of service on the app that you just bought. <laughs> you have no clue what it's like. Right, saying. no clue. But if that app could take half your 401k in your house and leave with your kids, you might read the terms of service before you just kept hitting accept, you know? And that's, that's the reality, you know? That's why I think if you put engaged people in the office of a divorce lawyer and just say, hey, listen, what, I mean, what here's are the- Here's the pamphlet, yeah, here's Look, everything. I do more prenups now than, than I ever did before. And, and, and more and more people are getting prenups. Do you think it's smart to have one? Or Absolutely. It, Absolutely. It's, no it's, matter what. It's not only smart to have one, it's incredibly foolish not to have one. No matter who you are, no, no matter, matter you where are. you're at in no your relationship, you no matter Absolutely. how romantic you are and how you're like, we're gonna be together forever. And Look, I don't plan on dying, but I have a will. You know, I know I'm going to die. You so have look, life insurance. Every, every yeah. marriage is going to end. It's At either going to end in death or divorce. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely going to end. There's no such thing as a marriage that lasts forever. It's mm -hmm. either going to end in death or divorce. Do you have a will? Okay, your marriage is going to end in death, so you have a will, right? Mm -hmm. Your marriage might end in divorce, so why not have a prenup? By the way, why not have a prenup for the reason I'm talking about, which is just to have some discussions about what do you expect from this marriage? Why are we afraid of that discussion? Mm. Why can't you sit down with a, with a person who you've been dating for that period of time and who you apparently like that much that you've decided you wanna have this person be the one you hold hands with as you walk into all of the challenges of the mm -hmm. world. You can't have a conversation with them and say to them, if this ends, yeah. maybe it's your fault, maybe it's my fault, maybe it's our fault, maybe it's some third party's fault, whatever. If this ends, and I'm not saying it will, I love you, knock wood, you know, but if this ends, what, would, what do you think it would look like? Mm. What would it look like? Like, would you set my shit on fire? You know, or would you, you know, would we like sit and say, okay, wait a minute, here's what I need, here's what you need. Would you want half my things? Would I want half your things? What would be important to you? What would we do with the dog? You know, what right. would we do with, and, and, and having that conversation, by the way, I, I believe very much so, and I've heard it said many times on your podcast by a variety of, of mm. professionals, we're the most alive in the presence of death. Mm. You know, we're the most alive in the presence of loss and sadness, you know? And so I think we're the most acutely aware of the value of love when we think about losing it. You know, when we think about, mm. what if this person was taken from me? What if this person who I love wasn't with me anymore? Like, what would I lose? What would I not have anymore? Because really it's a conversation about value. It's a conversation about, what is this person bringing to my life and to my heart, you know? And so why not have that conversation? That's, yeah. a, that's a great conversation. You know, there, there are, we're storytellers, human beings, you know? And, and my job is to tell stories. You know, my job is to go into a courtroom and tell mm -hmm. the story of a marriage to a judge 
in a way that flatters my persuade client. Them, yeah, yeah. Right, puts a halo on my client and horns on the other side. You know, and I want to persuade them to see things my client's way. That my parent, my client's the great parent, the other side's not the great parent. You know, if it's a custody case, whatever it might be. So I'm a storyteller by nature, and I have to learn how to how to spin some of the same facts into into different outcomes. And what I'll say is. I understand the power of stories, you know, and the, and the stories we tell ourselves about our marriage and the stories we tell each other about our marriage. We've all been out to dinner with someone who we're dating, you know, or married to, and somebody says, well, so how'd you guys meet? Mm -hmm. And so you tell the sweet little story of how you met. And everybody, like, kind of lights up a little bit. Like, nobody, everybody pays attention to that story. That's a fun story. Like, I like to hear that story. Yeah. I like to hear, how did you meet your girlfriend? Oh, yeah. tell me about that. And by the way, your demeanor changes when you tell that you story. You light up. You yeah, you light up a little it, yeah. bit. Right. And so I think people kind of, in that moment, there's a lot of, like, reconnection to the love again, right? There's a lot of reconnection to each other in that moment. Because why? Because you're talking about when this person wasn't with you and then they came to you and they added something to your life. Well, why not have that conversation when you're getting married? Why not have a conversation about what did I have before you? And if there was to be an after you, what would it look like for me? Mm -hmm. Because I think it, it's a very romantic conversation. I think it's a very romantic thing to speak so honestly to someone about here's what you bring to my life. Here's what I hope I bring to yours. If this ends in a way other than us dying, what would it look like? Yeah. How would I express my love for you? You know, mm -hmm. I'm very proud as a divorced man that my love for my ex-wife is still evident in my behavior. That's cool. It's still evident in the fact that I've treated her with love and respect and I'm still someone who supports her as a person and who's still emotionally there for her. I've embraced the man she married because he's now part of my family, because he's part of my son's family. So, you know, that's a, mm -hmm. an act of love, you know, to, 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 to talk about how marriages end in a very fearless way. And I think it'd be a, it'd be a great thing if people did it more often. Yeah. Prenups are on the rise. People don't talk about the fact that they're getting prenups because it's just not something, you don't on Facebook go, we just did our prenup. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You don't, you post, oh, we just tasted Here cakes. It is. Right? <laughs> we just tasted cakes or oh, we just found the venue. You don't say like, just finished negotiating the prenup or just finished you know, talking about the prenup. But it's something people are doing because they're, they're pragmatic and they're mm. realistic. And, yeah, yeah. You know, well, they know the stats too. Fifty-three percent. So it's like, let's be realistic. Yeah. Like, if something happens, hopefully it doesn't. Right. Um, now, would you ever? You've been you've been married. You've been divorced. Would you ever get married again? And do you believe in the technology in the way that it is right now still? Yeah, I, I believe very much in marriage. I think marriage is like the lottery. You're probably not going to win. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. but if you win, what you win is so good that it's worth buying a ticket. Mm. It's worth giving a try. My parents were married for over 50 years. My mom passed away two years ago after mm. a long battle with cancer. Mm. But they had a tremendous partnership and their lives were better for having loved each other. Mm. And they had ups and they had downs and they had challenges, but their lives were really enriched by the fact that they married each other. I, I think the upside of marriage is so good. And the downside doesn't have to be as bad as we make it. So I think we have to, I think that's where Esther Perel's got it right, is we yeah. have to reinvent how we view marriage. And we yeah. have to, as a culture, start talking about what's really going on in marriages and what, 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 yeah. what's really happening with them and what's really important to us in marriage and why we're getting married. We have to start looking at marriage as a technology, not as some romantic sentiment. And I think if we do that, we're going to find ourselves in a better place as a culture. And, and, and that's a technology that might be worth signing on for, mm. you know. But definitely a prenup. I mean, a prenup would be in order. <laughs> gotcha. Now, so you would get married again. Mm -hmm. Let's say you got married and it worked and it was amazing. And all the things happened that you wanted to happen and mm -hmm. enriched both of your lives. But for whatever reason, you realize 10, 20 years later, like, right. it's not working for us anymore. Right. And you decide to part ways again. Right. Would you get married again? Third time. Great question. So here's Would what I'll say. Would you continue to do it? We say, you know what? All right, I've done it a couple so of times. So I, I, I give. Yeah, it's I think not I, working. I had a it's client. Still I had a client um, who I did his fourth divorce. <laughs> oh my god. And a prenup for his fifth marriage. No way. Okay, and I had the same reaction as you. Yeah. But let me tell you what he said to me, and it was it was really it stuck with me. This is 15 years ago. <laughs> I said to him because he's an older fellow at that point. And I said to him, like, you know, look, you realize you don't, like, have to marry them, right? Like, you can, 
you can sleep with them, you can date them. You, you can live even, together. People live together now. Like people don't have, because I thought maybe he's old school. Like maybe no one told him, you know, <laughs> that it's okay. Like you can, you know, not from like the Vatican perspective, yeah, but yeah, like yeah. it's okay. Like you can do culturally, this. Nobody's going to look at you culturally anymore and say, shame you know, you shame on you. You're living in sin. So he said to me, look, he said, um, let's say you buy a car and you drive it for 20 years and it's super reliable and it gets you where you need to be. But eventually it just breaks down. So you go out and you buy a sports car. You buy a flashy, amazing sports car and within six months you realize this was a terrible idea. This was impractical. Yeah. This is not the right car for you. So you get rid of that car. And then you get another car that's closer to the first car and you really think, okay, this is going to be the car, you know. But for whatever reason, it just doesn't kind of mesh the right way. And, you know, maybe it's that your driving habits after all these years or whatever it is. But it breaks down and you get rid of it. Are you going to just walk everywhere for the rest of your life? Mm. And I remember thinking, okay, that's not bad. Like the truth is, is that we want to maintain connection. Marriage is not a decision that one person makes. It's a decision two people make. I mean, arguably more than two people because people get married not just for each other. They get married because their parents expect them to get married. Their culture expects them to get married. Their friends expect them to get married. So it's not even just about a personal decision between two people. Yeah. It's, it's, but no one ever gets married just because they felt like getting married. There, there has to be another person in the equation. So I think realistically, you know, people just keep trying. And, and, and I don't, I think it's foolish to say, well, if I had a failed marriage, I wouldn't get married. Listen, there are very few things in life that I was good at the first time I did it. You know, very few things. A lot of times I got to screw something up several times before I get it right. right. You know, I, right. I, I was bad at jujitsu for a good five years before I got even vaguely good at it. Yeah. You know, the first time somebody handed you a baseball bat or threw a spiral, you know, you, you didn't catch a football and go, oh yeah, I know how to do this now. It's something that you really have to fail. You have to suck at before you get good at it. So mm -hmm. marriage might be that kind of thing. You might have to suck at marriage a little bit. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe you can suck at it and improve at it during the marriage. Right. Or maybe you suck at it, you have to end the marriage, and you go, okay, let's try this again. You mm -hmm. know, um, it's, it's, it's a very personal thing, I think. And it mm -hmm. has to really do with, you know, again, I'm, I'm always afraid that anything I say about marriage is gonna come off as an endorsement of or a condemnation of marriage. And it's, it's not that. It's, it, again, it's a technology. I'm not for or against mugs. I just know what purpose they're supposed to serve and I know what problems they potentially create. And then the question is, is do you have that problem? Not do I have that problem. You know, if you say, is marriage good? For who? For me or for you? Or, or for your cousin? Or mm -hmm. for your mom? Who, you know, those answers are going to be different. Is that shirt good? Yeah, that shirt's good for you. It wouldn't fit me. Yeah. You know, so the question really is about, does this technology make sense for you? You know, and, and, and if you live in the tundra, you know, your Tesla doesn't make sense. So could I then say, well, Teslas are stupid? No, Teslas just don't make sense for you. So mm -hmm. I think marriage, why can't we look at marriage the same way? Why does marriage have to be one size fits all? And again, that's the kind of stuff that Esther mm -hmm. Perel, I think, says so eloquently. She said it on the show is that, yeah, yeah. you know, it, it doesn't have to be. It's about the two people that are in that marriage and the co larger context of the, of the group they're in mm -hmm. and figuring out what, if then that makes sense. Yeah. You know, not just is marriage good or bad. Mm. What do you share? You have two kids, you said? Or two, one? Kids, two kids, yeah. What, what advice do you give to them on marriage? You know, I've, I've always told them to take it seriously. Just take marriage seriously. I mean, my, my one son is 19, the other one's soon to be 21. Mm -hmm. And um, they're both, you know, I mean, my older son is at the age where I, I married his mother. Um, and we remind him of that constantly. <laughs> He's completely freaked out by it. Um, and my younger son is at the age where I moved in with his mother. And um, he's also equally freaked out by that thought, you know. But, but I, I'm very blessed in the sense that my sons grew up with a sense of marriage as a technology because of what their father does for a living. And also because, you know, we had to explain to them at the ages of you know, divorced, yeah. 10 or 8 and 10, we had to explain to them in a way that kid could understand. And the way we chose to do it was to say to them a very specific thing. We said to them... Mm. You know, mom and dad don't love each other in the very specific way married people are supposed to. But we both love you, and you're only going to have one mom and one dad, and we're always going to be a family. And we repeated that over and over and over and over again, mm. you know. Because think about, like, break that down a little bit. It's yeah. not mom and dad don't love each other. No, mom and dad love each other. 
There's a lot of people I love I wouldn't want to be married to. Yeah. We don't love each other in the very specific way married people are supposed to love each other. And kids can understand that. Because kids know the way I love grandma, the way I love mom, the way I love my teddy bear are three different ways. Mm -hmm. So it's okay to say, you know, I love this person, but I don't love them in the very specific way a married person is supposed to love their spouse. Mm -hmm. You know, and that to me um, is, is what I've always tried to say to them. Mm -hmm. It's just when you marry, if you're thinking about getting married, take it seriously. Ask yourself, what problem am I trying to solve by marrying this person? Look at honestly what they want, what you want, and what will likely happen in your life. Just like that car example, you know. Yeah, you don't know what's going to happen in life, but there are certain predictable things that you can think about. You right. know, I'm going to get older. I'm going to my health will fail eventually at some point. I may want to have kids. I mean, I'm going backwards, but yeah. you know, there so we will have misfortunes sometimes. We'll have challenges. So knowing what you're likely to come up against, mm -hmm. does this person make sense? Mm -hmm. And if the answer is yes, then you know, give it a shot. Have a prenup and give it a shot. Yeah. Is there a marriage that you are, uh, admire a lot that you've seen in your life? I have, yeah. Friends? I mean, I have, I don't have a famous person marriage I could point to, uh -huh. although um, I think Ted Danson uh, and uh, Mary, I forget what her last name is, they have a pretty, uh, they seem to be each other's fans in a huge way. I mean, I, I love when you see couples that have been together for an extended period of time and they're just still cheering for each other. Mm -hmm. They're just still like so like in this person's corner and they just look at them like, ah, oh, like I'm so proud of them, I'm so excited about them, you know? And that to me is, a, those are relationships worth having. Yeah. Um, I have a real relationship role model. I have two very dear friends um, who uh, have been married for a little over 20 years. I knew them when they were in college. We all went to college together. And um, they have two sons uh, who are roughly the same age as my sons and they still, she still refers to him as her boyfriend and he still refers to her as his girlfriend. Wow. And she'll write on her Facebook like, oh, my boyfriend's coming home today because he travels a lot for work. And she'll say, oh, my boyfriend's coming home today. And um, he legit, you know, Jimmy Iovine, the, the, the record you know, executive mm -hmm. and, and genius, yeah. um, said, because uh, he's, he's had an incredibly successful marriage and an incredibly happy marriage, long-term marriage. Was and he's the second one or the... Because he was married for a while and then he got This is his, right? his current marriage. Yeah, yeah. yeah his current marriage. Yeah. He's been married for an extended period of time. Got it. And his secret to it that he's pretty open about is never stop closing your wife. Mm. He just never, he's like, I'm always just trying to close. I'm always just trying to like impress her, woo her. It's and never so, finished. It's never, never finished. finished. Yeah. Right. It's always this. And that's why I said that, you know, marriage is hard if you think paying attention is hard. If you don't mm -hmm. think paying attention is hard, marriage isn't that hard. So it really is about, like I, I see in this, my relationship role models, I see in them this constant, like they wouldn't forget to get the granola. Mm. They wouldn't stop doing that little thing. That little yeah. thing that lets the other person know, man, I like you. I'm mm. cheering for you. That's like, cool. I want it to be good. Yeah, you know? yeah, that's cool. Make sure you guys get this book. I think it's really cool. If you're in my office, it's already too late. A Divorce Lawyer's Guide to Staying Together. Make sure you check this out. I think it's going to be really powerful. You can uh, get it right now. Um, a couple final questions for you. Uh, this is called The Three Truths. Okay. And if this was your last day many years from now and... All the stuff you've written and talked about and everything you've experienced and all your dreams you've had come true. Mm -hmm. But you wouldn't be able to leave them behind. You'd have to take them with you. So no one would have access to all your information, your message, your content, the mm -hmm. things you've done. You'd have to bring it with you when you, when you pass on. Okay. Uh, but you got to leave behind a piece of paper that said your three truths. Three things you need to be true about all your experiences in life whether it be from your career, work, love, relationships, parenting, whatever it may be, okay. but these would only be three lessons you could leave behind. Uh -huh. What would you say are your three truths? So I would say the first one would be that the hard thing to do and the right thing to do are almost always the same thing. Because I think that, that that's something I've learned in every aspect of my life, that the hard thing and the right thing are almost always the same thing. The second thing would be, it's all about connection. I would probably just write, it's all about connection. And I would hope that the person would understand what I meant. Mm -hmm. That there really was nothing else at the end of the day. It's that everything we do in our lives, whether it's our desire for sex, our desire for money, our desire for art, to create art, to create beauty, it's all about connection. We're just trying to connect to each other. And, and, 
And that's the beauty of it and that's the tragedy of it. Because in my office, I see the beauty of it and then I see the tragedy of it when we lose that connection or when yeah. we miss that connection or when we let that connection fall apart. So I would say it's all about connection. And uh, the, third, the third thing, I, I, you know, and it's probably a shallow thing to say, but I would say don't take it so seriously. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think when I look back on my life as a 45-year-old man, you know, solidly midlife, um, I, I look back on it and I think to myself that there really are only five or six moments that when I think about my life, I go, wow, that was such a great moment. And none of them when it was happening did I realize how great it was. Mm. You know, I think back now, I just had this thought the other day because both my sons are in college now and my youngest, I became an empty nester in September when my youngest went off to college. And I was thinking the other day about if I had to think of a moment in my life that was like the, just the greatest moment. And it wouldn't be like when I graduated law school or when I you know, uh, 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 you know, won some trial or when my book was published, you know. It, was, it would be like some night when I was divorced for a year or two and I you know, went to the store and got just what the kids liked to eat because they were coming for the weekend and I like made them dinner and they sat at the table doing their homework and we were just together and I felt like a really engaged, wonderful, loving father. You know, I, it wasn't the kind of father I had. My father was like a, of his generation kind of a father. You know, mm -hmm. he, he drank and he kind of, you know, didn't talk, talk too much about feelings or anything like that. He wasn't the kind of man that would read the mask of masculinity. <laughs> um, but, but it, to me, those little moments, those unexpected little moments, it's everything. And so just don't take all of the other stuff so seriously because when you look back, even in a marriage, like the, the, there are moments in that marriage that you, while it's happening, you had no idea that that was the best it was gonna get, you know? Mm -hmm. So just cultivate space, you know, and, and leave opportunity mm -hmm. for those ridiculous little moments that, that and don't take the rest of it so seriously. Mm, I like those, yeah, that's cool, man. Thanks. I wanna acknowledge you for a moment, Jim, for uh, there's a lot of pain that couples go through. It's a lot of heartache, a lot of misery. There's a lot of stress, anxiety through the divorce process. Mm -hmm. So for you to give some great information from your almost two decades of, of insights to be able to hopefully prevent a lot of the pain that people don't need to go through, uh, I want to acknowledge you for Thanks. using your gifts, for using your information Thanks. and presenting in a way that is fun and interesting and Thanks. inspiring but also informational so we can hopefully not make a lot of mistakes that 53% of people do make. Um, not even mistakes, but just being aware going into right. what we're doing and having all the information laid out. Right. Yeah, I'd love to put myself out of business. Yeah. I say it all the time. I'd love to put myself out of business. I don't think it'll happen. I don't yeah. think that any, I think the truth's out there in a lot of things and, and, and you know, um, but, but can people apply the truth and are people mm -hmm. interested in hearing it? Um, I yeah. don't know. I hope so. You know. Same thing with nutrition. You know, there's a lot of nutritionists that right. would love to put themselves out of business when all the information is available for us. Right. For some reason, we keep making the same mistakes or getting obese yeah. or hurting yeah. ourselves in that way too. But you've got a powerful gift, and I'm glad that you're Thanks. able to present this information in a fun and interesting Thanks. storytelling type of way. So I acknowledge you for, for all that you're doing, man. And I'm, I'm glad you came on. I think this will be fascinating for a lot of people. Uh, final question before I ask it, make sure you guys get the book. We'll have it linked up with everything else talked about uh, on this page, on the resources and the show notes. The final question is, what's your definition of greatness? I would say greatness is, is um, diving deeply into what you do. You know, mm -hmm. everything that you do, just diving deeply into it. And, and, you know, the tragedy of our time is people spending five days a week looking forward to two you know, 50 weeks a year looking forward to the two weeks vacation they get. You know, to me, greatness is about identifying and diving deeply into the things that make you feel alive and that make you feel connected. You know, mm. again, it's all about connection. I mean, it's ridiculous that a divorce lawyer who disconnects people for a living is preaching the gospel of connection. Right. But, but that's the truth. It's about connection. It's about connecting to yourself, connecting to other people. So I would mm. say the definition of greatness for me is about just diving deeply into connection. Mm. Jim, thank you. Great man. to see Appreciate you. Thanks so much for Thank having you. me. Appreciate it.